This tropical island teems with rare and exotic life. It's a place where apes live in the trees. Snakes fall from the sky and lizards fly. The place is an Eden called Borneo. Straddling the equator and divided between the countries of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei, Borneo is the Earth's third largest island. The warm morning mist that shrouds Borneo's rainforests conceals a stunning wealth of life. The vast jungle here provides shelter for some of the rarest, strangest, and most magnificent creatures on Earth. This island is both rich and fragile, a self-contained world of surprises and transformations. Borneo is dominated by Mount Kinabalu, a massive outcrop of rock more than 13,000 feet high. The forests on the slopes of Kinabalu are on a giant scale, too. Many of the tallest rainforest trees in the world are found here. Massive buttresses keep the whole structure stable. With all the energy focused upwards, the trees grow to heights of more than 200 feet. Between the forest floor and the tree canopy lies a complex, multi-level realm. Many creatures colonize different parts of it, but few have mastered it, like Borneo's great ape, the orangutan. In time, this baby will acquire the strengths and skills of the adult male, but orangs develop slowly, and he still has a long way to go. A fully developed male is incredibly strong. Where they flourish, they're undisputed kings of the canopy. But they're also one of the rarest apes, found only on Borneo and neighboring Sumatra. The first six or seven years of a young orang's life is spent close to its mother. From there, it can safely explore its surroundings and get to know its neighbors. Life in Borneo's forest canopy often defies expectations. Many animals live and die here without ever touching the ground, and danger comes from any direction.
With the snake on his trail, the lizard keeps moving. But the end of the branch is not the end of the line. By fanning out the skin attached to its rib cage, the lizard can fly between trees. But the snake has some tricks of its own. Spreading its ribs and flattening its body, the snake becomes an airfoil. And by adjusting its body shape, it can guide itself toward its prey. this hunt, the snake is outmaneuvered. Borneo is one of the wettest places on Earth. As rain clouds build over the forest, they're driven higher by the mass of Mount Kinabalu. Constant rain washes the top of Kinabalu clean of soil. When the first rain strikes the hot granite, it's driven off as steam. There's nothing to hold the water on the mountain, and within minutes of a rainstorm, towering waterfalls are born. Some parts of Borneo can receive more than 15 feet of rain in a single year. The journey of the water from the mountains back to the sea continually shapes and changes the island. South of Mount Kinabalu, in Gunung Mulu National Park, the flow of water over millions of years has carved out one of the largest cave systems on Earth. In the depths of the caves, it's permanently dark and damp. But even here, there's life. Cave swiftlets use clicks as a form of sonar to navigate through the darkness and reach the spot they've chosen to raise their young. The nest site is high on the cave's slippery walls, and with no building materials available, the swiftlets adapt to making their own out of spit. The bird's saliva is perfect for sticking to the cave wall, and it dries rock hard on contact with the air. Even so, it may take two months of work before a pair has completed their nest and are ready to breed. Each one of these ingenious nests is worth its weight in gold. They're gourmet delicacies, the main ingredient of bird's nest soup. For the birds, though, the nest allows them to raise their young out of reach of most predators. Far below on the cave floor lies yet another world and another level of existence. This is the domain of the cave's caretakers. Although nothing grows here, the resident cockroaches never go hungry. 
Dung from the swiftlets and from bats carpets the cave floor, providing a rich source of food for these scavengers. A swiftlet fatality provides an occasional feast, and down here, nothing goes to waste. Blood, bone, and feathers are all fuel to be consumed. The carcass is stripped down and recycled in a matter of hours. For this mighty army, work is never done. Farther into the cave, there are other scavengers at work. Crickets move in to occupy the deepest and darkest corners. To cope with the absence of light, they develop extra long feelers. With them, they navigate and can sense prey. Food might be swiftlet eggs or easier pickings, like a bat that strayed too far into the cave. It's hard to grasp the sheer scale of what the water created here. Deer Cave is one of the world's largest cave passages, more than a mile from end to end. But it's only outside where the proportions become apparent. These trees are 80 feet tall, but still dwarfed by their surroundings. Here at the cave's mouth, the afternoon sun provides just enough light for plants to gain a foothold. As evening approaches, the pattern of activity in the cave begins to change. The night shift prepares for action. The walls near the entrance are covered with wrinkle-lipped bats. By day, this is their dormitory and nursery, a place to rest and recharge for the night's work ahead. outside fades, the first flight of bats can't wait any longer. A few thousand leave the cave, which is enough to trigger the whole colony. With approximately three million bats here, it takes a full hour for them all to clear the cave. Once out in the open, the bats are vulnerable to predators. Hawks patrol the cave exit, ready to pick off any stragglers. So while they wait, the bats go into defensive formation. A massive wheel that pulses and spins on itself. Eventually, the formation reaches a critical size, and at some hidden signal, the whole swarm unwinds itself and heads for the feeding grounds.
Using their sonar, the bats sweep the forest canopy for the clouds of insects that hover around the treetops. Meanwhile, a second wave prepares its hunt. Tonight, the bats from this cave alone will harvest many tons of insects. As darkness falls, another cycle begins for the creatures of the forest. The moon is full, but little of its light filters to the ground. Mouse deer, about the size of a rabbit, are small enough to pick their way through the tangled undergrowth. Here on the dark forest floor, sound is as important as sight, and the mouse deer are skilled at finding their food silently. But not so for this spiny-tailed porcupine. His clumsy foraging broadcasts his position. And in the forest, you never know what else is listening. This time, the hunter is a fish owl with a different meal in mind. Safe for the moment, the foraging resumes. For the young orangutan, it's another day of learning from its mother. By the age of six or seven, juveniles wander away from their mothers and begin to learn the skills necessary to become fully independent. That means starting with the basics. Orangs have an amazing grip, but they also need coordination. This youngster must learn to make two nests a day, a small one for the afternoon nap, and a larger one for nighttime. For orangs, these skills are essential, but that doesn't mean they come easily. This time in a young orang's life is just after it leaves its mother. Thank <laughs> you. 
Learning to survive is a slow process, but persistence eventually pays off. This youngster discovers where there's something worth eating. For this tiny baby, it will be several years before he masters these skills and can fend for himself. Finally, the young nest builder succeeds. The battle with the branches is over. Now, it's nap time. The rainforest is not an easy place for animals to live. Foliage is plentiful, but many of the leaves are too tough to eat. So when the fruits arrive, they're doubly important for the animals as a source of food and for the trees as a chance to disperse the seeds inside. Each species of fruit tree is widely scattered across the forest. For the animals, being in the right place at the right time is everything. This prevost's squirrel wins the prize. But it won't be able to keep a whole tree full of fruit to itself. Once a rainforest tree is in fruit, it's open season for anything that can fly or climb to reach this bonanza. As soon as these figs are ripe, gibbons and other animals will harvest them, and within a couple of days, all will be gone, just as the tree intended. The durian fruit is one of the orang's favorite foods. By carrying it away before settling down to eat, he helps spread the seeds inside away from their parent. Many fruit trees need a way of getting their seeds to travel even farther. Inside the stomach of a hornbill, they can move for miles and have a better chance of landing in some unclaimed patch of light. Even those seeds that fall short get a chance to travel because they taste good. The next stage of this seed's journey will be through the stomach of the forest's largest inhabitant. These are Borneo's pygmy elephants, once believed to have been introduced here by man. Recent research suggests that they are genetically distinct from other Asian elephants and may be indigenous to the island. Despite their bulk, they move almost silently through the undergrowth as they search for their favorite foods.
The deepest and densest parts of Borneo are the strongholds for one of the rarest mammals on Earth. The Sumatran rhino. There may be only about 50 left in all of Borneo. The few survivors lead a solitary existence, each one ranging over a huge area of forest. As well as being loners, they're also creatures of habit. As they browse, they always follow the same large circular path. But it may be many months before this female retraces her steps. Living in such isolation, it's highly unlikely that she will find a mate by chance. So the rhinos communicate by leaving markers for each other. The spray leaves a message for any passing male that she's now in season and looking for a mate. Much of a rhino's time, when not browsing, is spent in mud. A regular wallow is the best defense against biting insects. Total immersion helps keep the skin in good condition. And in the heat of the day, a mud pool is the best place to rest. The water that started on the peak of Mount Kinabalu almost reaches the bottom of its journey. On its way down, it serves as an artery, carrying animals and plants, energy and food from one level to the next. Before the water flows into the ocean, it passes through one more layer of island life. Here on Borneo's borders, land, fresh water, and salt sea come together to make mangrove swamps. These mangroves are a nursery for millions of fish and other creatures. And the growth that happens here affects the food chains far out to sea, as well as inland. The proboscis monkeys that live in the swamps are unique to Borneo, and only a few thousand remain. The mix of salt and fresh water makes this a difficult environment. But to these monkeys, it's home. Life is a communal affair. Call and response helps keep the family group together. As the search for food takes them through the trees on the shoreline and along the mouth of the river. A troop this size can only survive here because proboscis monkeys adapted to a food source that few other animals can cope with. The slightly poisonous leaves and bitter fruit of the mangrove tree itself. The monkey is really a stomach on legs. To cope with such a poor diet, 
Its belly holds a large chambered stomach with powerful digestive bacteria. Silvered langur monkeys feed in this patch of swamp too. Although they couldn't look more different, these two are mother and baby. The strange golden orange fur makes the infant highly visible and more easily protected by the rest of the troop. But once it's three months old, the baby's fur will slowly turn silvery gray to match the mother's. The adult's diet consists primarily of leaves, as well as fruits and flowers. To find enough to survive, the monkeys forage almost constantly. From a distance, the mangrove mud looks empty, but it's not. It's actually a rich feeding ground, and once the tide goes out, the bizarre inhabitants appear. The fish here can walk. And conventional looking crabs are definitely in a minority. The male fiddler crab's overdeveloped claw is built to impress. The purpose of the display is to attract females and to keep other males away. And with neighbors everywhere, displaying is a full-time job. The mud skipper survives on land by breathing seawater stored in its gill chambers. Like its competitors, it's after the rich crop of algae suspended in the mud. Although there seems to be plenty of mud, most of it's already occupied, which makes would-be squatters most unwelcome. With each tide, the swamp's ingredients receive another stirring. And down at the water's edge, there's often something special on the menu. For this long-tailed macaque, a ripe mangrove fruit provides a small meal. Macaques are not specialized feeders, and to survive in the swamp, they must travel widely to collect food. When they can, they live on a diet of small animals. Crab would be a delicacy. But with none in sight, ripe fruit will have to do. Some macaques wash their food before eating it, which may help remove sand and improve the flavor.
For the mud dwellers, feeding time is over. Their tide is turning. As the crabs sense the water's approach, they know it's time to hole up at home. Borneo's extraordinary abundance of life doesn't end at the limits of the land. Just beyond its shoreline is the frontier of another world as rich and complex as anything on the surface. Borneo's reefs lie where the Indian and Pacific Oceans overlap making its waters the meeting point for a mass of marine life. These reefs are called the rainforests of the sea. They're blessed with a huge variety of corals, which support a wealth of microorganisms and a hierarchy of fish to feed on them. But all of this abundance attracts attention. The reef is a magnet for predators. Ocean-going hunters like the barracuda are drawn to the reefs in large numbers. Other visitors also find the reef on their last leg of a long migration. After as much as 25 years away, these turtles return to the island of their birth. Now ready to breed, they may have covered hundreds or even thousands of miles of ocean to reach the reef just below the beach where they were born. The turtles linger at one of the reef's cleaning stations. Here, special fish make a meal out of their parasites and dead skin, leaving the turtles more comfortable and possibly less prone to infections. The pause gives the female turtles a chance to gather their strength for the last and most important part of their journey. In the waters off the reef, males wait. And when the time is right, each female moves off to join them. The turtle's breeding season lasts for several months, and the eggs laid at the start are now hatching. It's time for these babies to begin their own journey. Every instinct drives them to leave the land and head for the greater safety of the out of every
Borneo, an island in the clouds.